Hello and welcome back to I Made This. My name's Ollie and today I am making Marty McFly from Back to the Future out of plasticine. And yep, as always, just bulking out the character with a bit of tin foil just to save on weight and plasticine. Just starting to flesh out the character with a bit of plasticine. Uh, if you notice, I, I tend to do very thin legs and then probably bigger, broader upper torsos. I can only boil this down to like reading and drawing comic books for the past, I don't know, 30 years. You know, um, loving shows like the Batman animated series where, you know, the characters have usually got little scrawny legs but then like a massive upper body. I don't know why I like it, it's just a design style that I like. I don't know about you guys, but like I was born in the 80s and grew up in the 90s and Back to the Future was always there. It was always on TV on bank holidays or summer holidays or at Christmas. I mean, it still is to this day. Um, and it's just a fantastic film that, you know, the story, it's just, the story itself is just so well told. I'm sure you can say some bits have probably haven't aged as well, but the actual core story is still fantastic. And, you know, the thing that boggles my mind is the film that we could have got where, you know, Eric Stoltz was originally cast to play uh, Marty McFly and actually, you know, filmed half of the film and, you know, they had to go back with Michael J. Fox and reshoot majority of the film and you know apparently there's some shots where you can actually still see Eric Stoltz in the background and uh, you know his character was meant to be a bit more aggressive or a bit more of a, a bad boy which, why, which is why there's you know there's a lot of references you know to Strickland and stuff like that to saying he's a loser and he's a bad seed and stuff like that and uh, you know when you watch the film you think well no he's actually quite a nice kid really and it's just the way that Michael J Fox chose to play him I guess um, yeah and Making this character, I thought he'd actually be really quite easy to make because, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it. But then as I started to make it, I realised, oh, he's got a T-shirt on. Then he's got a white shirt, which I've got to make a collar. And I hate doing collars, which I've probably stated before. And then he's got another denim jacket over the top of that, which also has a collar. And then on top of that, <laughs> he has his padded red jacket, you know, his life preserver, which also has a collar and tons of detail. And plus, you know, I'm a sadist, so I decided to make his skateboard, his Walkman, his watch and his rucksack. And, you know, I'm glad I did because, you know, it all adds to the character at the end of the day. But it was a lot more work than I was actually anticipating. So this video may be a little bit longer than, than usual. And that's one thing I'd like to ask you, actually. Would you rather I did shorter videos? Uh, you know, are they too long? I'm not sure, too sure, so I'd love to know what you think about the length of these videos. Going back to Back to the Future, you could probably say that George McFly is in fact the lead of that film. He's the one who has the arc. I mean, you know, Marty really doesn't really change by the end of the film. You know, actually throughout all the films, you know, uh, you know, George McFly is the one who has the arc and the character growth in that film. Uh, you know, the second one, I'm not really sh too sure if anyone has, but then in the third one, it's, it's pretty much uh, Doc's film, isn't it, really? You know, when he falls in love with Mary Steenburgen's character, what's her name? Um, Clara Clayton. Yeah. I suppose you could say maybe the second one is Biff's film, because, you know, there's loads of different versions of Biff in that film. You've got Griff, you've got Old Man Biff, you've got the 50s Biff. You've also got the alternate present day Biff where he's basically like Donald Trump and he lives in that massive tower. I say present day, I mean like, what, 1985? But yeah, now I'm just uh, fleshing out the arms. Uh, it's always weird doing the the forearms first before everything else. It's like putting your socks on before anything else and then looking in the mirror just looks odd. <laughs> so yeah, now I'm just doing the sleeves of the denim jacket and just bulking that out. But like I said, you know, with Eric Stoltz originally playing Marty McFly and then becoming Michael J. Fox. It felt like there was a, it was a slightly troubled production. And you know, like even Robert Zemeckis' a choice of uh, composer, you know, the producer Steven Spielberg didn't even want. And you know, you can't even think about Back to the Future without that amazing score that Alan Silvestri did. And uh, then when you get to the sequels, um, Crispin Glover decided not to return because you know, he wasn't getting paid as much as he thought he should be and so they cast like a, another actor to play George McFly. You know, only kind of in the background or kind of dithering around and, uh, you know, applied uh, makeup to him to make him look like Crispin Glover and then probably reuse other footage of Crispin Glover without his consent from the previous film. 
and you know that kind of caused a massive snowball effect in the industry because he sued them and won and then it had a knock-on effect on other films such as Alien 3 where they didn't pay for Michael Bean's likeness and uh, you know they originally created a dummy where his body had been burst open by a chest burster and you know, he wasn't happy about this and didn't consent to it and eventually they kind of contacted him and said well can we at least use a photograph of you and he was like yeah but as long as you pay me lots of money and I think he got paid more for that little picture than he did for the entirety of Alien. It's crazy, and uh, it's kind of kind of similar kind of to the um, Crispin Glover situation. Ugh, I hate doing collars. Why do I always do this to myself? And now I'm just filling out the back. I probably didn't need to do this, it's going to get covered by the puffer jacket anyway, but oh well. Uh, yeah, now I'm just doing his uh, his puffer jacket. Now this was actually quite fun to do, it took a while, but I actually quite enjoyed making this part of the costume. It's crazy to think in the 80s and early 90s, with the films and the cartoon, and I guess even the ride, there were no action figures, you know. I think they did like a Burger King or McDonald's Happy Meal kind of toys. You know, you had Star Wars, Ghostbusters, uh, Ninja Turtles, but no Back to the Future. I would have loved to have had like a Kenner uh, Time Machine DeLorean that could go alongside my Ecto-1, my Batmobile and my Ninja Turtles party wagon. It would have been awesome, but you know, it wasn't to be until like several years ago, we've started to get like a slew of Back to the Future merchandise like with the Necker action figures or Hot Toys, you know, those highly detailed 1-6 figures. I mean, several years ago, I actually picked up the Playmobil, of all things, uh, DeLorean. And it's a fantastic toy, actually. It's a really nice representation of the, of the DeLorean. And it's kind of like what I was hoping I would have got as a kid, to be honest. It's got like, you know, fun light up features and, you know, you can turn the wheels to make them look like they're flying and things like that. And it's great. And, you know, recently they released the, uh, the Lego DeLorean. I mean, they did a little one a few years ago, but this one's like quite a big, beefy one, which I'd love to get my hands on and do like a little uh, time-lapse stop-motion video of me putting it together for the channel. But, um, yeah, I haven't been able to get hold of one as of yet. <laughs> but as soon as I do, there'll be a video on the channel, I promise. As cool and awesome as these action figures are, there is one major issue. Okay, so the Thomas F. Wilson, Biff Tannen, and the Christopher Lloyd, you know, Emmett Brown figures, they look great, and they look almost like the actors, and I think it's probably because they've got very defined features. Whereas the Michael J. Fox, Mike McFly figures, they never look quite right in my opinion. And I think it's similar to um, Mark Hamill, you know, Luke Skywalker from Star Wars. The figures of him have the same problem as well. I think because they've got such baby faces in those films and they've got floppy hair, that there's just something that's hard to translate. There's no like defining character feature. There's nothing to kind of to grasp onto as a sculpt or something like that that you can kind of say, yeah, that's Mark Hamill. Yeah, that's Michael J. Fox. I think as they get older, so like Mark Hamill is the older Luke Skywalker they're starting to look a lot more like him because he's got more defined features, hasn't he? You know, you know, jowls and things like that as you get older. It's a lot easier to kind of convey that in sculpt than just like a soft features because there's more to latch onto. And in this like renaissance of Back to the Future, while we're not actually going to get a new movie and I don't think we should get a new movie because I think those three films work wonderfully together and I don't think they should be remade. I mean, Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis have both said that they'll never remake it or do a sequel. But you can actually get comic books and there's the Telltale video game where the voice artist is fantastic. He sounds just like Michael J. Fox. If you close your eyes, you think you're listening to Michael J. Fox. And then also a couple of years ago, the musical opened, which I really, really want to see. It looks fantastic. And again, this guy's voice sounds just like Michael J. Fox. And he actually looks quite a lot like him, to be fair. And I don't know about you, but I genuinely miss seeing Michael J. Fox regularly on our screens, you know. I think it's been over 25 years since his last lead in a feature film, you know, with The Frighteners, which is a great film. If you haven't seen that, check it out. But yeah, Parkinson's is just horrible, and it's just it's robbed us of some major talent over the years. 
Um, you know, I know he's popped up in TV shows now and again, you know, he was in a couple of episodes of Scrubs and I think he actually directed them. And I think he was in The Good Wife as well as a lawyer. But yeah, I think he's pretty much fully retired now, which is a shame, but you know, we love you Michael J. Fox. <laughs> Um, yeah, just doing the hands, and it's the same technique as I used before, where I use the Allen key and uh, create a little sausage of plasticine and kind of press the Allen key inside of it to kind of create a hole, and then I place it over the wire of the fingers. And it seems to work all right for me. Like, in your head, you think that's the future as a special effects film. It's not really. There's not many special effects. There's like a few visuals like with overlaying flames like that at the beginning and then at the end you've kind of got the motion controlled flying car at the end but other than that there's, there's, it's mainly all practical in camera effects um, I, the, for me the biggest effect is the the makeup they applied to the actors to make them look older i mean when i was a kid i it blew my mind when i found out they were the same actors that played the younger versions and the older versions i mean when you're older you can you can see it now but like you know Leah Thompson was fantastic in that film. Her makeup is so believable as when she's the older version of um, uh, Lorraine. You know, a bit of alcohol bloat and things like that. And uh, then when you see the, the version at the end when, you know, history has changed because George is more assertive and he stands up for himself and both of them like look like totally different people you know a lot more together and you know kind of well composed as opposed to the George McFly of the alternative 1980s where he's kind of like a bit sheepish and he's kind of got the slick black hair and you know he's kind of doing that laugh that <laughs> you know he's kind of like a meek kind of guy whereas you know in the other present day he's kind of really assertive and you know it's only a very quick scene but you can kind of really tell the difference in the characters and apparently Crispin Glover hated doing that he did not see that as the same person but you know Robert Zemeckis obviously won out on that Yeah, just doing his shoes now, just adding some detail like the laces and then the, the Nike tick on the side of each of the feet. Now I'm just doing the cuffs to the side of his uh, denim jacket. I was never actually sure if these were the cuffs of the denim jacket or if there were the cuffs of the shirt underneath who knows the actual shirt is actually checkered and uh, you know but to do that in plasticine you know you can actually draw over it with felt tip pen but you know if you start manipulating it it starts to become a bit mushy you know I've done tattoos on characters before with felt tip pens and uh, you have to be very careful about moving them around And now I'm just adding some actual detail to the jacket. I wasn't actually too sure if this was a little bit too far, if I should have just kept it as is. Um, I sometimes struggle with knowing when to stop with detail. I don't know about you guys, but uh, it's something I always struggle with. You know, do you keep it very clean and concise and just kind of very simple, or do you add a bit of detail? And it's, it's about knowing when to stop. And um, yeah, like I said, I struggle with that sometimes. And I think maybe I went a bit over the top with the detail on this, but I'm not, I'm not too sure. I don't know, you can be the judge if I went too far with the detail on this. And now I'm just going to start making some of his accessories out of Fimo, 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 Fimo. And now I'm just uh, sketching out the skateboard. Uh, I actually used to work in a skate shop when I was younger and, um, and I used to put together people's custom skateboards and I used to love doing that, like 
putting the bearings inside the wheels and screwing on the trucks and then applying the grip tape and things like that and kind of styling it out where you put like some details into the grip tape and stuff. I used to really enjoy doing that. But you can't talk about Bats of the Future without talking about Christopher Lloyd and how good he was in that role as well as the mad scientist Emmett Brown. I mean, I'm not exactly too sure what the history of those two characters are and how they got together, Marty and Doc, but um, they make such a great duo. I mean, so much so that, that, I mean, that's pretty much the basis of Rick and Morty, isn't it? You know, just kind of dialed up to insanity levels. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you ever watch the very original Rick and Morty short, which I think is called Rick and Morta or something like that, you can find it on YouTube. And I think, you know, Justin Roiland's created it for like some comedy club or something like that and that's how Dan Harmon found out about it and then you know together they create Rick and Morty. But yeah without Back to the Future there would be no Rick and Morty would there? But yeah um, Christopher Lloyd is just fantastic in all three of those films you know what a dedicated performance and you know but you know Christopher Lloyd is like and he's nearly in his mid 80s and he's still going you know, he was recently in Nobody, where he played the father character for um, Bob Odenkirk, and uh, you know, he's been in some fantastic films growing up. You know, he was in the uh, Adams Family movies. Uh, Roger Rabbit is one of my all-time favourite films. You know, what a, what a career he's had, and still continues to have to this day. And now I'm just making his headphones. Actually, Marty's headphones are black, and um, I chose to do them in this kind of bright orange colour just because they were the kind of ones we had when we were kids, and uh, just making it my own a little bit, because like, I thought it'd just add a little bit of colour, a little bit of, made it a little bit more fun. That scene in the film is great, though, where he puts the headphones on his dad. You know, he's wearing the hazmat suit. <laughs> I am Darth Vader from the planet Vulcan. Yeah, just making his Walkman now. Is it a Sony Walkman? I think so. Not too sure. I loved my Walkman when I was a kid, and uh, you know, making mixtapes, you know, was one of my favourite things to do. And you know, we'd always constantly pass around tapes to each other at school, introducing each other to new music and things like that. It was good fun. My rucksack was full of cassette tapes at the bottom that were kind of covered in sellotape, where I'd kind of open them back up and kind of sellotape the snaps tape back together and things like that. <laughs> Again, I've probably went way too over the top with the detail on this, but you know, sometimes when you're in it, you kind of get into like the, the minutiae and the kind of the minute detail of it. It's easy to get carried away with it, but I actually think the skateboard turned out quite well. Now the FIMO's baked, I'm uh, just uh, painting on some detail. Like, I'm not sticking too strict to what the detail on the uh, actual board was, just kind of more of an impression of it. And I'm actually putting some real sandpaper on for the grip tape. So, you know, which is technically what grip tape is. <laughs> And then just to kind of sharpen up the detail, I'm kind of using my craft knife just to scratch away at the paint a little bit. And then I'm just gluing everything together, the wheels and the trucks and everything like that, and then attaching them onto the skateboard. Now I'm just putting the headphones all together. And gluing some wire onto the headphones. I'm actually adding some screws to the top of the skateboard just for that added <laughs> extra bit of detail that I probably didn't need to do. And now I'm making his rucksack. I apologise, I didn't film this very well. The camera went out of focus. I think the autofocus feature on my camera's a bit knackered these days. But 
Yeah, I think it's a Herschel bag, not too sure. But yeah, this was fun to make. It actually didn't take that long. I was quite surprised. Just adding a bit of wear and tear to the bag and some zip lines. And there's the rucksack. And now it's time for the head. This is actually the second time I made this head. Uh, the first time I made it way too big. And uh, yeah, you look like a bobblehead. So I had to start again <laughs> from scratch. But yeah, as always, you start out by just rolling out the plasticine into the shape of a head and then pulling out the nose, pushing in the eyes, building up the bridge of the nose. And again, I pull out the eyes and just roll around the eye sockets a little bit just to kind of smooth them out. And then I build up the upper lip and then the lower lip. And then add some extra details like the chin and the eyebrows. Like I said, in regards to the action figures, it's really hard to get a likeness of Michael J. Fox. I mean, I've done several of Mark Hamill before Luke Skywalker, and they've never looked quite right. And uh, I'm doing my best with this one, so please forgive me if it doesn't look quite like Michael J. Fox. But yeah, just doing the ears now, just kind of trimming them up a little bit, just making sure they're not too Dumbo-ish. I mean, it's a bit unfortunate he's starting to look like a... Uh a certain Russian leader at the moment, but um, that will all change as soon as I've added some hair. Just building up the eyes and cheeks just so they don't look too sunken in. This hair was a pain in the bum to do. Just plasticine hair in general is quite difficult. It's either a case of you want to go really detailed or you want to kind of really simplify it and it's, it's kind of trying to find that middle ground where it's, you know, it's not too detailed but you know, there's enough there that kind of emulates the kind of, the look of Michael J. Fox. So what I decided to do was just do some wispy bits at the side and then kind of like a parting in the middle, like a poofy parting in the middle with some additional hair strands like coming out so it kind of looked a little bit, a little bit messy. And then I built it up a bit at the back just to kind of make it a little bit longer and shaggier at the back.
Yeah, just building up the front of the hair a little bit just so it sticks out a little bit further. And there's a bit more shape and volume to it. And then these little bits of the hair are what you can probably animate with when you're like moving the hair, just so it kind of the hair's got some movement to it. I'm just adding some eyebrows and then the final touch, some eyelids. Now I'm just doing is a watch, you know, because the, the famous poster of Bats the Future was, you know, Marty looking at his watch while kind of one foot kind of stepping out of the uh, DeLorean while holding up his sunglasses in the air. It's a very iconic poster which they kind of emulated for all three of the films, didn't they? And there's the body complete, and the head attached, and voila, he is done. I'd like to thank you very much for watching and if you enjoyed this video please uh, give it a like and please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Probably going to slow down a little bit on the claymation characters for a little bit and uh, kind of focus on either some toy videos where I'm actually going to make a toy from scratch and show the various processes of that like from the concepts and early designs to the sculpting to the moulding and the casting and painting and then creating the box art for it. And I'm also going to do some behind the scenes for some of my music videos that I've worked on, especially those for the psychedelic porn crumpets and uh, things like that. So yeah, lots to look forward to and uh, I hope to see you on the next video. Right, take care, goodbye.